The story of the National Steel Corporation begins not in one location, but in many. It is the story of seven divisions welded into America's fifth largest steel producer. We begin it by calling the roll. Weirton Steel Company of Weirton, West Virginia and Steubenville, Ohio. World's largest independent producer of tin plate. Major producer of a wide range of steel products. Great Lake Steel Corporation of Ecorse in the Detroit area. Only integrated mill in the Motor City. Leading supplier of automotive and many other types of steel. The Hanna Furnace Corporation of Buffalo, New York. A blast furnace division producing merchant pig iron for foundry use. Hanna Iron Ore Company of Minnesota, Wisconsin and Michigan. Supplier of iron ore to its sister companies of National. The National Ore Boat Fleet. Carrier of the ore that feeds the mighty blast furnaces of Detroit, Weirton and Buffalo. National Mines Corporation of Pennsylvania, West Virginia, and Kentucky, providing National's mills with a high-grade metallurgical coal for the production of coal. Strand Steel Division of Ecos, Michigan, and Terre Haute, Indiana, exclusive manufacturers of Quonset buildings, as well as natable steel framing and flooring. National Steel Products Company of Houston, Texas, a leading distributor in the Southwest, serving thousands of customers in a seven-state area. Administrative headquarters for National is Pittsburgh, city of steel. Our story is not only of mills and mines, it is primarily of men. First, of the men who head the business. Chief Executive Officer Ernest Tenor Weir, founder of the company, key figure in the industry for half a century. George R. Fink, former president both of National and Great Lakes Steel Corporation. Thomas E. Millsop, now president of National, also of Weirton Steel. It is the story second of the man who founded the business, Ernest T. Weir. This chapter of the National story takes us back to Clarksburg, West Virginia. The year is 1905. Two young businessmen, James R. Phillips, left, and Ernest T. Weir, are inspecting an old tin plate plant. They have good jobs with a big company, yet they want to buy this shutdown mill and go into business for themselves. Phillips and Weir agree. They'll return to Pittsburgh, try to raise enough money to buy the property. In a Clarksburg hotel a month later, the money having been raised successfully from a small group of businessmen and acquaintances, Phillips reads the charter of the new company to young Weir. To mine for, quarry, produce, reduce, treat, prepare for use, transport, and deal in iron ore. <sighs> Leave it to the lawyers, Ernie. They've got us mining ore, operating blast furnaces. Why, we're just tin plate producers. The charter's all right, Jim. All we have to do is grow up to fit it. Then we'll be an integrated company. From ore and coal to finished product. That's what we want, isn't it? Yes, that's what we want, all right. But you know, even though we've actually raised $200,000 to buy this plant, there are some people who still say we're crazy. I know. Imagine, quitting the biggest and richest company in the business for what? To go into business as competitors. And with what? With a broken down plant in Clarksburg, West Virginia. That's what they say, Ernie. That's what they say. And I say they're wrong. Our company is going to be a success. I'm sure of it. So am I, Ernie. I guess we'll keep that appointment at the bank tomorrow and spend the $200,000. Then we can start showing people just how wrong they are. Well, gentlemen, you bought the property from us for $190,000. One third payable now, the balance over the next two years. Congratulations. Thank you, Mr. Wagner. Thank you, sir. Do you think you can get her operating in the next three months? We'll be turning out tin plate by the 1st of May. Three weeks.
three weeks? Impossible. Of course it is, Mr. Wagner. Absolutely impossible. But we're going to do it. And so they go to work. It isn't easy, but slowly, painfully, the old mill begins to come to life. One fine day, John Williams, their plant superintendent, brings them a present. About as nice a one as two young businessmen could want. Our first tin plate, Ernie. We're in business. That's right. And you know what date it is? Why, well, yes. It's May 1st, 1905. We're on schedule. That means I can go on to New York on that sales trip. I'll leave tomorrow. That's fine, Jim. Fine. Phillips. Gone. Ernest Weir has to continue alone. The company is hard put. 1905, deficit $23,000. 1906, add two mills. Production up, deficit wiped out. Surplus, $32,000. 1907, depression. Short but acute. Clarksburg production still rising. Gross sales, a million eight hundred thousand dollars. Nineteen oh eight. No rain. Drought. They buy ponds, pump pools, trench water to the plant. Up production and add four new mills. Total now twelve. Nineteen oh nine. Three men travel to Hancock County, West Virginia. Driving the buggy is John Williams. Ernest Weir and David Weir, his brother and associate, ride in the back. Their destination, Holiday's Cove on the Ohio River. Their mission, to find a site on which to expand a growing tin plate company. Williams, David and Ernest Weir like what they see. A fine sweep of land, a broad river, a chance to build from scratch, not only a new industry, but a new community, a better way of life. Here, Ernest Weir can build his integrated steel company. In 1909, he begins. Ten mills go up in Holiday's Cove, now Weirton. Twelve more are bought in Steubenville. By 1915, his tenth year, he is the world's largest independent producer of tin plate. Constantly expanding, ready to integrate, he builds a blast furnace. Open hearth furnaces, a blooming mill. He buys ore properties, coal properties. 1922, the 1905 shoestring has assets of $7 million. 1929, Ernest Weir initiates steps with two other companies toward total integration. One is the old established M.A. Hanna Company with its extensive iron ore properties. A fleet of lake ore boats is also brought into the merger by Hanna, at this time under the able leadership of George M. Humphrey, as well as blast furnaces in Buffalo and Detroit. Also in Detroit is the second company. Along the Detroit River, George Fink, founder of Michigan Steel, maker of auto body sheets, is filling in swampland to build Great Lakes Steel, the Motor City's first integrated steel plant. Summing up, this is what the merger brings together. Weirton, a mighty river steel plant with its own coal properties. Hanna with its ore, boats to carry the ore, blast furnaces in Buffalo and Detroit to turn oil into pig iron. Great Lakes, neighbor to the auto industry, with easy access to Hanna's ore and Detroit blast furnace. Weir plus Humphrey plus Fink equals total integration, the National Steel Corporation. In 1929, as the three men are concluding merger arrangements, this. Thirty days later. A bad time to launch this trademark? They make it a good time. 1930, National earns $8 million. 1931, National earns more than all other steel companies combined. 
1932, National only steel company to earn a profit. And they keep it that way. Today, National has 30,000 employees, a production of 6 million ingot tons a year. From the same hilltop on which he stood in 1909, Ernest Weir today sees a mighty productive enterprise stretch out before him. But more than that, he sees a story of people, of achievement. It could be told in Detroit or Buffalo, but we shall tell it in compact Weirton, where it is easier to see. This city of 30,000 is typically American in some ways, unique in others. It is well governed. Twice mayor is Tom Millsop, elected overwhelmingly both times, without campaigning, without making a speech. How many houses were built because this free enterprise flourished? Thousands. In Weirton, 95% of the families own their own homes. It is a city of harmony, where 37 nationalities of all faiths worship in freedom and tolerance in 35 churches. It is a city of good schools, A city of good recreational facilities. A city where people have a good time. It is not a one company town. As Weirton Steel grew and prospered, other industries were established here too. It is a city that gets things done. This is its million-dollar community center, built by the citizens with an assist from the company. It offers recreation and meeting facilities for the entire community. Another example, a new four million dollar hospital here being dedicated. Think about it. How much has a decision made in 1909 contributed to thousands of people, not only in America, but in many parts of the world. And what has made it possible? When you come down into the valley with Ernest Weir, you know. It is production, humming, pulsating, throbbing all around you. It is a big story, big in scope, in color, in drama. It is the story of Steve. George Spink knows well. This is the former swamp land they said wouldn't hold a steel plant. Today, the massive mills and furnaces stand as a tribute to George Spink's vision. And Tom Millsop knows it too. Has known it since he started in the business, working at an open hearth furnace like this at 10 cents an hour. The making of steel is one of the vital industrial stories of our time. Let us tell it. Where does it start, this story? Start it here in the rich red pits of the Mesabi, where iron ore, that essential of steel making, is mined and begins its movement toward the mills. Today, National is helping to develop another source the 400 million ton iron ore fields in Labrador, Quebec, the rich strike known as Angaba. At Duluth, huge ore boats are loaded in less than two hours. Some carry more than 20,000 tons in a single voyage. Underway now. Destination, Detroit. Buffalo, and by transshipment, Weirton. Don Lakes. Hewlett unloaders remove the cargo in great bites. In a matter of hours, the ore is stockpiled, ready for use. Started simultaneously with the arrival of high-grade coal from one of National's mines. At the mills, it will be baked in airtight ovens yielding valuable byproducts, and then expelled in a red-hot charge as coke. Started 
it to at a quarry where limestone, the third important ingredient, is extracted. It helps remove impurities from iron ore in the blast furnace. Three beginnings, ore, coke, and limestone. And at National's towering blast furnaces, these raw materials are shuttled to the top in skip hoist cars, unloaded and joined under tremendous heat to produce iron. Four times a day, the furnaces are cast. The hot iron flows on one side, the waste product slag on the other. At National's Buffalo Division, the molten metal is cast into molds called pigs. This is the pig iron used in the manufacture of wheels, stoves, machine parts, and other products. In Detroit, hot iron pours into thermos cars, which maintain the temperature during a two-mile run to the mill. The firebrick-lined cars, each holding over a hundred tons, unload their seething cargo into the hot metal mixer. to the Bessemer, where air blasts burn away many of the impurities. In National's open hearth furnaces, largest in the world, scrap and limestone are charged. iron from the Bessemer. The cook begins. Despite its immensity, steel production is controlled to the finest detail. Frequently during the open hearth process, test samples are taken from the furnace and cast into small bowls for analysis. While the cook continues, these are rushed to the quality control laboratory and scientifically examined for the guidance of the open hearth men. Time to tap. Open hearth, the jet torpedo is bazooka fire. One of the most majestic sights in steel making unfolds. Amid flame and smoke, like a scene from Dante's Inferno, the molten steel is poured into ingot molds, a breathtaking operation known as teaming. deceptively hot. Reheated, the ingot, 20 tons of it, is rolled into a slab in National Slabbing Mill in Detroit, most modern in the world. automatic hot scarper, which melts away the skin of the slab, cleaning it, giving it a perfect rolling surface. Now the slab
slabs are cut to length, irregular ends trimmed. Each slab weighs from seven and a half to eight tons. The end of the line, ingot to finished slab in a matter of minutes. This mill is not only a triumph of engineering, but it is built in the national tradition for quality production, for efficient production, for safe production. For further rolling, slabs begin to move in National's famous 96-inch mill in Detroit, first of its kind in the industry. Each slab will be pressed into an extremely wide sheet of steel, permitting manufacturers to make auto parts, hoods, floors, car tops in one piece. Otherwise, they would have to be made from two or more narrower widths at greater cost. momentum, the sheet passes through the rolls at speeds up to 2,000 feet a minute. Optical pyrometers are used to check the temperature of the hot metal as it races by, heading for the coilers. In another of National's mills, a slab starts rolling in the 54-inch hot strip mill. seconds, this slab is reduced to a strip of steel no thicker than a piece of cardboard, 750 feet long. This is volume steel production, an endless succession of hot coils streaming off the line. Compare this to Ernest Weir's early days at Clarksburg, where a crew of nine worked eight hours to roll 10 to 14,000 pounds. The equivalent production takes about three minutes on this modern continuous mill. The strip is cooled, then goes to the pickling lines where scale and foreign matter are removed. Finally, in the cold reduction mill, steel is rolled to customer specifications, whizzing at a mile a minute clip into five mile long, 15 ton coils. Some of these steel coils go to the continuous galvanizing line, where the metal is coated with zinc for galvanized roofing, sheeting for heating and ventilating systems, drinking tanks for farm stock, and other products. Other galvanized steel may be corrugated for concert buildings, an exclusive national steel development. America uses and discards 34 billion tin cans a year, and this mill, largest in the world, provides much of the tin plate for that consumption. Steel strip races through three decks of the electroplater and is coated with tin, first on one side, then on the other. Into the coilers it comes, tin-plated steel, one of the world's best-known products. Careful inspection, the tin plate is cut into specified sizes. Another specialized product of National is NAX high tensile steel, low alloy with exceptional properties that provide greater strength without increase in weight. National's famous nailable steel flooring is made of NAX. It's used for everything from auto hubcaps to all steel truck trailer bodies. 
Stand on this hilltop with Ernest Weir and share yesterday's accomplishments, tomorrow's horizons. Look at what he sees. Production that builds communities, homes, schools, and fulfills the dreams of many thousands through this flow of product from Nationals Mills, NAX Steel from Detroit, and coils from Wilton, thin bands, and corrugated sheets, pig iron, and tin plate. Look at it. But better still, look beyond to where you, the consumer, see steel. On the highway. In the factory. In the home. On the farm. On land. At sea. In the air. Look at a modern metropolis. Look anywhere. And there is steel. What has it meant to America? Listen. Still might and still are well and to win liberty for all that be in the flame of freedom blazing whatever may be called Till every burning moment until company is the fall Oh, we must ever all.